So hi, my name is Dr. Eliane Ratcliffe. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about constipation in children. The first thing I wanted to let you know is that constipation in children is really common. It's one of the most re common reason that kids will come see their family doctor or their pediatrician. Um, some of it can be because of changes in bowel habits, and some of it could just be that they have tummy pain or abdominal pain, and the family isn't too sure of why. Some things I hear when families approach me will be, they'll quietly say to me, oh, you know, my little guy or little girl had this huge poop. They didn't poop for a few days, and they had this huge poop, and we had to, like, cut it up and use a plunger, and they'll be really kind of horrified by this and tell me really quietly about it. And if this has ever happened to someone you know, I just want to reassure you that's actually kind of really common um, that that pattern can happen and it really is going to be a sign of constipation and certainly good to talk about with your physician because we can help you out with that. The other thing commonly people think is that um, their kid poops every day um, and then that means that they're not constipated. Um, so we're going to show you an example of the Bristol stool chart while I chat a bit here. And I'm going to point out that even if someone poops every day, they might not fully get all the poop out and they still can be getting backed up. Um, and often we see people with a pattern that one day they have what the kids call these little rabbit poops, which is the Bristol type 1 that you're going to see on the chart. And then they'll have that for a few days and they maybe don't poop. And then after a few days they have a Bristol type 7, like the really loose runny poop. Um, and not recognize that not all can be part of a pattern of constipation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what causes, what we think causes the cycle of constipation in children. So it's thought to be related kind of um, in those first year, few years of life, kind of a disruption in normal bowel habits. And one example could be as simple as uh, often with toddlers, they can be busy playing and they're playing with their trains and they're really focused. And even though they have to poo, they kind of, that's not a good time to poo, and then they don't poo. And what happens is that the, the fecal matter or the poop gets sort of built up into their rectum, so the lower part of their gut, and maybe now we can show a picture of what the normal colon and rectum look like, because so you know what I'm talking about. And uh, the poop can kind of build up and build up in the rectum and sigmoid and become kind of a big poo ball. And then when they actually are going to have a poo, it kind of is really uncomfortable because instead of having a nice soft poop, they're going to be pooping out this kind of big, hard, uncomfortable poop. And then the kid starts learning that, oh, going, going to the bathroom can be really uncomfortable. And then they start not wanting to go. And this is not a conscious thing. So it's really important to know that kids shouldn't be blamed for these changes in their bowel habits. It, it becomes subconscious, but their body themselves learn wow, it's going to be really uncomfortable poop and I'm not going to go do that. And so then you get into the cycle of what we call the withholding behavior and you'll see kids totally do it. You, you talk about kids doing the toilet or the poo dance where you can tell that they need to go when they're doing this little dance so that they don't go. Um, but what they're doing is that they're trying to hold the poop in because they know it's going to be uncomfortable when they go. And then what happens is that the poop gets stuck there, you get the ball of poo, and then, because it's staying there, the body actually absorbs even some water out of the poo there so it gets even harder and more difficult to pass. And this, this is really kind of what we feel is that whole cycle that sets up what we call functional constipation, which really is this pattern where you have this withholding behavior and then you can alternate having the hard poop and the soft poop. Because the other thing I need to tell you about is that because that hard poop is stuck there in that sigmoid and rectum, that sometimes all that can come out are those little rabbit pellet poops that kind of drop out, or the only poop that can come, ar come around is this wet poop that comes around the ball of poo, and then that just sort of leaks out. So either that can look like wet poops, or in some kids they can have something that we call encopresis. And this is poop that just sort of leaks out and um, is either in their diaper or uh, in older kids in their underwear. And, and this can be really distressing because people feel uh, that it's like an incontinence or kids are really embarrassed because they're leaking out a bit of poop and they might smell a bit poopy at school. It can be a reason why some kids have really trouble transitioning to getting out their pull-ups and getting into their underwear. Um, 
So this is a really common reason actually kids come to see us as pediatric gastroenterologists because it could be, just be so distressing for the child and for their family. So then kind of what do we, what do we do about that? So the mainstay of therapy is to address the poo ball. So, cause that really is the most common pattern that we see. Um, about 80 to 90% of the time. It's actually really the most common pattern that we're gonna see. Um, so number one is we have a really good chat with the family, a good chat with the child. We get a sense of all that's going on and what their stool pattern is like. Uh, we will do a lot of education in terms of what that cycle looks like, just like the little chat I'm having with you guys now. And then we need to clean up that poo ball. So what we do is that we do kind of what we call a clean up phase where we gotta get the poop out. Um, so usually it's a lot of uh, gut laxatives. So we use something called um, PEG or polyethylene glycol 3350. There's lots of commercial products on the market. Um, and essentially all, the, all those things do. Well, you know, I'll tell you what I tell the family. So I explain um, that when my mom serves strawberries, she cuts them up and she'll put a bit of sugar on the strawberry and the sugar draws the juice out of the strawberry so you have strawberries with a bit of syrup and that's pretty yummy. Uh, that's the same way something like PEG 3350 works. It works by osmosis. So it does kind of sprinkle in the gut and helps draw water from the wall of the gut into the poop to make the poop nice and soft. Um, and so one of the reasons why we feel that it's safe because it's not really something you absorb and it's something that really just goes to the poop to make it soft. So that's really the mainstay that will give a lot of that product in order to get the poop nice and soft, in order to get that poo ball out. And sometimes we even use things that we use, like we use for kids or adults for a colonoscopy clean out. So we'll use something even stronger to really get that poop out because uh, that's the first thing that we need to tackle. If there's a problem in giving those products and getting the child to drink it, we also sometimes do uh, an enema root um, that can help get that poo ball out from the bottom. Um, now, usually we have the idea of that um, cycle really based on the story and talking with the family and physical exam we often can feel the poop just in in the tummy so in case you're wondering about what kind of investigations we do uh, usually it's a good history and a physical exam that will actually let us know that this is going to be the, the constipation Sometimes we do x-rays. X-rays haven't been shown to really be the mainstay diagnostic procedure for constipation, um, but sometimes we'll do them if we're having a question, we wanna see the pattern of fecal loading. Um, sometimes we'll do a study, what we call a shape study, where uh, the child will swallow a capsule with little shapes in it, and a few days later they have an x-ray, and you can see where the shapes are in the x-ray, and you can see if they've pooped everything out so that would show us that they've been able to poop within a certain timeline or the shapes are stuck and we can kind of see where they are um, on the x-ray and get a look. If things are looking more complicated and not responding to our standard treatment of constipation then we might start looking at some blood work and rule out things like Hirschsprung's disease, uh, look at thyroid function, look at celiac disease, look at the spine and make sure it's not related to spina bifida. The interesting thing in children is that, um, that there can be things that they're born with that can relate to their bowel function. So for kids, we tend to make sure on history that we really ask those questions. Um, but again, if, if a child is not really responding to our main standard treatment, that's kind of when we start looking at things that might be a little more complicated. So then once we get through that part in terms of sort of a maintenance phase, so once we're kind of confident that it really is a poo ball problem and we get the poo ball out, then we need to maintain for a while. Um, we find that when the poo ball's there, the rectum and sigmoid have gotten kind of stretched out. Um, so you really need to need, keep the poop nice and soft in order to get back to a neural bowel function. And that's where we're gonna use a product like, again, the, the PEG3350, uh, use a product to keep the poop nice and soft and help the child really get back to a normal bowel routine and start feeling more comfortable with their regular bowel movements. Um, sometimes we use other drugs to help stimulate the gut in different ways. Um, but again, when you get to that point, usually at that point you're talking to either a pediatrician or a pediatric gastroenterologist um, if we need to get to some of the more advanced therapies. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is well, are there other treatments beyond the 
the, the pharmacological therapy or the medicines, that there are other things that you can do to help a child have sort of a nice normal bowel routine. Um, so we do do some counseling on uh, drinking water and fiber intake, although unlike in adults and children, there really is no evidence that you really have to eat necessarily a specific di diet, but we do encourage like a nice healthy varied diet with whole grains and fruits and vegetables and just sort of a healthy diet. Um, we talk about things about like a nice um, bowel routine um, so that the child isn't going through this beholding behavior, but they're kind of in a routine of sitting on the toilet. I usually do some education with families about what we call the gastrocolic reflux, and that's just a reflux that when you eat about 20 minutes later that often you feel like you have to poop. That's a nice thing to keep in mind that the child knows maybe after a meal, that's a good opportunity about 20 minutes later to sort of sit on the toilet and kind of relax. We don't like kids stuck in the toilet for too long, but just sort of a time to sit in the toilet and relax a little bit and see if that's a way of getting the poop out, making sure the child's supported on the toilet, like little ones, when they're sitting on the toilet, they can have their little legs dangle off. That's probably not the optimal position to be in for a comfortable bowel movement uh, and for functioning of the pelvic floor. So we'd like to have their feet supported so they're supported when they're sitting on the toilet or kind of more almost like in a squatting position on the toilet. And then there's been a lot of interest, um, like in the adults, looking at things like pelvic health physiotherapy. So I know a lot of our centers are um, having using physiotherapy as part of the therapy with the child. Um, it can also be more external type therapy and more exercises, more mind-body awareness. Um, therapy is targeted for the child to be more aware of their pelvic floor and therapies that kind of allow more relaxation of the pelvic floor. And then, and then there's a lot of interest in research going on in other complementary therapies, such as, such as acupuncture, looking at acupuncture parts, points, and then looking at TENS, um, all ways to kind of relax and stimulate the pelvic floor um, and help target that kind of vicious cycle of that withholding behavior and having discomfort with, um, with passing poop. So that's sort of what I wanted to talk about today with you about um, constipation in children. I hope this has been helpful. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, these are all great things to talk about with your primary care provider or with a pediatric gastroenterologist as needed.